This video is about object detection using an algorithm called YOLO. Um, first, I'll, be, I'll talk about what the object detection problem is and explain a naive solution to solve it. Then I'll explain the steps of the YOLO algorithm. And then I'll go into how to implement the YOLO solution for your own uh, YOLO application. Um, so to begin, YOLO um, object detection is a problem that's distinct from classification. In object detection, our goal is to identify and locate objects within an image or video. So here in classification, as you might remember, it's attaching one label to one image. So for example, this image is a cat, and we want to label it as a cat. Um, in object detection, our problem is a bit more complicated because now we want to locate multiple objects within an image, and we want to find their location. So you know, this image has a dog and a cat. We want to identify both these objects here. We want to draw a box around that. And then in this object, it's you know, finding that there is a car, but on top of that, we want to know where is the car in the image. So we call these boxes that we're going to draw bounding boxes, and we'll explain how we encode them and work with them a little bit later on. Um, so one naive approach borrows a lot of the same logic from classification. The idea is here, we, the idea is that we have a sliding window. That we pass through the entire image and scan through here. As it scans through, it takes this little window here and passes that into a classifier model, much like we saw in the past. So as it slides through, it takes all these little snippets and these windows and passes it through our classifier model, which might be like a convolutional neural net. And then from there, it will predict, is this a dog or person, is it, is it anything? And it's doing that for every single window that we pass through. So for most of these, it's going to predict absolutely nothing, right? Because there's nothing to predict. But for some, sometimes when this window lands on like an image of a person or a dog, then it predicts something. So there's, that's how we basically can use borrow the classifier logic to basically predict where objects are in, a, in an image. But the thing is, this is slow because you're passing it through a bunch of you're passing through a bunch of windows that don't contain anything, so it can't be used for like real time cases. Um, and then uh, one improvement is something called the region based convolutional neural net. And this model, what we're doing is we are looking for areas of interest. So instead of passing you know each window into it, we're looking for areas that might have an object. So we would use something called image segmentation, and I give where an object might be, since there's like some contours, there might be some interesting shape here. And then we would pass like this object or this window in here into the classifier models. We wouldn't pass, you know, something like over here where there's clearly nothing in it. It would appear that there's really not much um, of a shape over here, right? So that's the idea behind the R um, regional convolutional neural net. It is an improvement over this naive approach, but the model we're going to talk about today called YOLO is a much, much better, much faster um, object detection model. So next, talk about the steps of the YOLO algorithm. The YOLO algorithm is called um, it's, it's called you only look once, YOLO for short, because it can pass in a whole image into a convolutional neural net and then predict the um, output in one, one pass. So it's much faster than passing in windows one after the other. Um, the idea here is that a convolutional net is predicting some type of, of, of predicting on an image labels, bounding boxes, and confidence probability. So it's coming, it's bringing all these different values out with just one pass through the convolutional neural net. And here's a pretty quick overview. We pass in an image, we pass it into a convolutional neural net, and it outputs a nice, um, a nice label and a confidence probability, and then a bunny box around the object. So the steps of the algorithm are as follows. We're first going to take an image, we're going to divide it into an S by S grid. So for example, we are setting S equal to three, so we're dividing it into nine equal cells here. And the cell is a one little box. And then each cell is responsible for predicting um, B number of bounding boxes. So in this case, B equal, is equal to two. So each cell here is responsible for predicting two bounding boxes. And what we mean by each cell is responsible for predicting two bounding boxes is that if the center of the bounding box falls within the cell, then that cell should predict that bounding box. So as you can see here, this bounding box around this car the center is right here, and it falls within this cell border here. So this cell should predict this bounding box. And as you can see here, sometimes these bounding boxes do extend beyond the cell, and that's perfectly fine. As long as the center falls in the bounding box, that bounding box, or the center, the bounding box falls in the cell, um, that cell should predict that bounding box. Um, and what, what happens is you, you see there's a lot of different bounding boxes here that don't contain anything. So we would set some confidence threshold, and anything 
below the confidence interval um, is just gets removed and we return one of the boxes above the confidence interval. So that's why all these boxes are gone. And then this box, which has a higher confidence interval because there actually is a card there, would be returned. And then the rest are basically we call surprised. And you can, of course, vary this confidence um, threshold. But in this case, it was something like 90%. And that's a little side note here. Um, the idea here is that you know S was a small number of three, but in practice, you'd use a larger number. And you would set B equal to a larger number as well. You can predict um, way more objects in the image. So how do we take these bounding boxes, which are these squares around ob interesting objects, and encode them into some type of matrix we, which we can predict from our convolutional neural net? That's what we're going to explain in this slide here. Um, we're going to start with a simple example where there is going to be a three by three, um, three by three grid, and there's going to be a total of nine cells. And then each cell is going to predict only one bounding box. Last time it was two, but this, this time we're going to predict exactly one bounding box. The objects are either a dog or a human. So here's the image. We're going to cut it into nine cells, and we're going to be focusing on this particular cell here, which is interesting because it contains a human. And for each cell, we're going to predict a vector y. So we're going to predict the vector y for this cell. And I'll show you what belongs in the vector y. So this bounding box is denoted by a center, bx and by, and has a height and a width, um, bw and b height here. These values are going to get brought into this y matrix or y vector. Um, so these values are over here, these four values in the middle here. But we also have two, uh, three more values. PC is the probability that the bounding box contains an object. So it's the probability that this blue box contains an object. Um, and then C1 and C2, there, this is a conditional probability. It's the probability that the cell contains an object that belongs to class one. Or is it a probability that this, that this cell contains a dog, given that this bounding box contains an object? So these are condition probabilities, but these are allow us to you know, say, given that this, um, this, the bounding box contains an object, an object, what is the probability that this, um, this cell contains something that is a dog or a human? And then so we're going to walk through an example here. So you saw here that, um, that for this particular cell, the probability that contains an object is high because there's obviously a human here. So this should be a value of person one. And it has values, um, some type of values here for the bounding box's center. And then the width and the height, these are actually written as a percent of the cell's dimension. So it's, um, so it's B height is actually a percent of the cell, of the cell height. And then B width is, a, is the width of the bounding box is a percent of the cell's width. But cell's width, yeah. So these are basically um, how we, we write the data here. And then for C1 and T2, well, C1 is obviously should be zero because this is this is obviously not a, a, um, a human; it's a dog. So I mean, this is obviously a human; it's not a dog. So the probability that it's a dog or a belongs class one should be low, which is why it's near zero. And then the probability that this particular cell contains a human is high because there actually is a human here, so it should be closer to one. That's how we can basically take this bounding box and break it down into a, some probability and then some, um, vector, and some values, variables that show where this bounding box is and what size it is. Okay. So that was a particular case where there was exactly one bounding box, right? Each cell was predicting one bounding box. What if we want to predict more than one bounding box per cell? The idea here is that we can, we, we can predict now two bounding boxes. So we have a blue and a red bounding box. Um, the blue box has you know the same bx, by, bh, bw, and then the red bounding box has the same type of uh, variables to specify it. What we do now is we can just extend or augment y. So now we have these five variables, you know, this bounding box, and then these five variables, you know, this bounding box. And as you as you mentioned earlier, these pc, it's a probability that this bounding box contains an object, right? So it's unique to this bounding box. And PC here is now the probability that this bounding box contains an object, so it's unique to this bounding box. So what we have here is that these five different, um, these five variables here denote each unique bounding box. And then, as you might have recognized, that C1 and C2, there's only um, it, there's only two of them here, right? Because there's two classes. And the reason why is this is the probability that the um, cell contains an object that belongs to class one, right? So it's, it doesn't depend on the bounding box. It, 
as much because it's just the product that the cell contains an object. So that's why there's going to, only going to be the two classes are going to be two, um, two, ver two, two values here. So as you might have noticed here that y has the dimension 5b plus c, um, there is five, five variables for each bounding box, and then there is b bounding boxes, and then there's going to be um, c, c, um, c classes here, so there'll be c, c values here. So this is the dimension of y, and we have, remember we have one y for each of the cells here, so that allows us to say that we are predicting a y for each cell, and then each y should be of the form um, i, b plus c. So that means we have um, s by s cells here, and then each cell has i, b plus c values in it. So that's, you can think of it as in this, this dimension here. So the resulting, um, was what we're going to want to predict from our convolutional neural net is a bunch of y vectors. And each y vector, uh, we can think of this, the, the y vectors together as something called a tensor, which is just a, a fancy way to say a bunch of multidimensional matrix. We're going to store data in it. And it should be of this shape, this shape s by s by 5b plus c. So it's the um, s by s, which is the dimensions of the um, cells. And then we have the 5b plus c, which is the length of y right in this direction here. So um, to the overview, the Euler algorithm we saw was we have an input, we pass through a convolutional neural net, and then we get out some output, which we, we label here. And what that actually looks like is that the image is broken down into width and height in pixels, and then there's RGB, so there's three color channels in it. So we'd have three, you can think of it as three, like, um, three sheets, and these are each of the colors. And remember, RGB is just a, a value for the color, right? So between 0 and 255. So it allows us to take an image and break it down into basically a tensor or some you know, multi-dimensional matrix here. We pass this into a convolutional neural net, which is, at the end of the day, a series of, of convolutional and pulling layers, if you're familiar with that from the convolutional neural net module. And then from there, you basically are predicting this S by S by 5B plus C tensor out. So this is an overview. We're not going to talk about the CNN, but the idea is here is we know what the outputs are, and we know what we know what the inputs are, we know what the outputs are, and then the goal is we want we're just training we're just training this part when we build our training model. So um, one of the one of the important things with any model is to measure performance. You want to see how well your model is actually predicting. Um, in this case, we're using something called union over intersection, which measures the overlap between two bounding boxes. And in particular for this, we are going to be using a, um, in training, we're going to be calculating the UI between the predicted bounding box and the ground truth. The ground truth is the pre-labeled bounding box that we're aiming to match. So this is the image here. And then we want to label the ground truth, which is the correct label. This is the correct maybe human made label for the box. And then the predicted bounding box is the box that our um, machine learning model or convolutional neural net predicts. And the union over, union over intersection is the area of the intersection, which is this area here, over the union of the area of the union, which is the whole, um, the whole green and the blue involved here. So that's this shape here. And this fraction is what we call the union of intersection. And just to quantify this, there might be a poor union over intersection or a poor score if it's very low overlap, and it might be good if it's higher, and then it's very um, good if it's almost exactly on top. So one of the issues with these types of, uh, of object detection models is that you might have the same object being counted multiple times. And we can solve this with, with a technique called non-max suppression. Um, the idea here is that we are going to want to basically remove, remove um, bounding boxes in the case where the same object has multiple bounding boxes with the same label on top of each other. And I'll walk you through the steps here. So, First, we want to identify the box with the highest confidence. So that's this box here, um, the blue box in the back here. And then we are going to now calculate the unit of intersection between the blue box and all the other boxes with the same label. So the blue box um, and the orange box has a union over intersection of 0.62. And then we can also cal calculate the union over intersection of the blue and the purple box. Now we're going to set some thresholds. So we're going to set the threshold to, to be something like um, say 0.3, and any, um, any of these boxes with a union of over intersection 
greater than 0.2 will be suppressed or removed. So as you can see here, the orange and the orange with the blue and the purple with the blue have a union or intersection greater than 0.3. So we're going to suppress them and remo remove those bounding boxes. And now we're now we're left with just the blue bounding box. So next, I'm talking about how to implement YOLO for your own particular use case. So it's common to use a pre-trained model. One of the big problems is that there are so many, or to, to basically get your images ready for a YOLO model, it takes a while. You have to draw the bounding box around all your objects, and you need, and you need many, many images to actually train the model well. So what tends to be used is something called these, these pre-labeled pre -labeled images. You can find um, from a variety of basic databases online, and you can use those to train your model. Or a lot of people have already went ahead and built very good models using those pre-trained um, images already. So you can just take their models, download them, and use them in your own applications. Uh, one of these, one of these places where there's a lot of pre-trained labels, with pre-trained labeled images, is something called the COCO or the con Objects in Context. Um, this particular data set is a has a variety of, of different images that are labeled used for you know, object detection and image segmentation. Um, one of the challenges is that if you don't have, if the object is not in COCO in that data set, you won't be able to use it. So here is a particular image of some fruit. We're going to pass it into a YOLO implementation, which was, of course, pre trained with a COCO model. And then we're going to output um, this, this image with these bounding boxes labeled. Now, you might notice that the cantaloupe and then the pineapple, they're not in YOLO, so they're not, I mean, they're not in the COCO data sets. So they're not going to be correctly outputted or, or even picked up by the model, so it doesn't do anything. And um, that's why, you know, it's predicting the orange, the apple, and the banana, but in the bowl in the back here, but it's not predicting anything with this pineapple and this antelope because it doesn't exist in the database that it was trained with. So the COCO data set is pretty large. It has a variety of different um, objects in it. Um, here's just a quick list of some. There's a person, a car, a motorbike, a traffic, light, and so on. And then you can um, go to the documentation and read about all the different types of objects you can that these models have been built with. Um, so that was using a pre-trained model. What tends to be the case is you might want to build a model that predicts objects that are not in COCO, right? So if the object is not in COCO, or if it is in COCO, it's great because you can go ahead and download a pre-trained model and just um, go ahead and, and build your application using that directly. And here's some, I just think some image AI, which is implementation that has a pre-trained YOLO model using COCO, as well as a darknet, that's another another pre-trained models, these are very easy to use. You can just look up the API and, and use them pretty readily. On the other hand, if the objects are not in COCO, then you'll need to build a custom model. And in this case, you'll need to go um, need to find images of the, of the particular object you want to predict on. You need to label the images. And you'll need to go through and build your YOLO model. And you can do this in a variety of ways. One of them is to you know, build your own model using OpenCV, TensorFlow, and Keras, build the whole um, pipeline out. Or you can also use some libraries. So ImageAI has a nice library where you can actually, you know, customly tra custom train your model using images that you label yourself. And then real quick, here's just an image of the Coco pre-trained label. So if you're interested in trying to build adaptation, you can check if what you want to predict is in this data set here. And then here's some further references to reading. And that's it for the YOLO model. Um, next, I'll be talking about the code in the next uh, video.